know, I have to be honest, I had no idea that today was International Potluck Day, but it just so happens that those are two of my favorite things, international people and potlucks coming together on this special day. So it is a blessing to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Matt Jones, and I am a pastor here at Harvest Valley Church, but I also work at Berkeley City College in their international education department. So this whole thing is just like, wow, God, this is really cool. So uh, before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to thank my beautiful wife, Alyssa. Um, she let me preach on our fifth wedding anniversary weekend. It's kind of a big deal. I mean, that takes a lot of sacrifice. <clears throat> Last night, she was up until 11, helping me with my message and preparing my sermon slides. She's totally an angel, so thank you. You're so good. And uh, thank you, God. I mean, I'm so appreciative of the opportunity he's given me to have this marriage and this ministry together. Five years, man. That's, uh, it's an accomplishment. I, I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm very thankful. We can clap that. We can clap that for sure. Yeah. Um, wow. So five years may not sound like a long time to many of you, but I've learned a lot of things about marriage in this first half decade. If you've got your field notes or a journal or just some place that you like to jot down your thoughts, here's a, here's a first nugget for you. As Pastor Derek had uh, so kindly pointed out, this one's free. The next one I'll, I'll be charging, um, be taking a collection. So I've learned if you want a happy, healthy marriage, if you want a happy, healthy marriage, you need to know if your spouse is a morning person or a night person. And once you know, don't fight it. Let me say that again. Don't fight it. Just obey the laws of nature. Like gravity, you can't fight that one. You cannot fight this one. Now, I thought about polling the audience this morning to try and figure out who my night and morning people are, but your attendance here tells me everything I need to know, or you're just really great at hiding it. So, well done on joining the 9 o'clock service. I do hope you come back at the second service for our international potluck. It's going to be off the charts. But, um, you know, I, just, I was thinking it didn't take me very long to figure out that my wife is a night person. Notice I didn't say that Alyssa is not a morning person. There is a difference. Free tip to all the men out there. If you want a happy marriage, do not talk about your wife in negative terms. But if you want a negative experience, try talking to a night person before 9 a.m. Should you be so brave, make sure you have the proper protective equipment. Maybe a helmet, some gloves, a cup, a mouth guard, you never know what can happen when you try to awaken love before it's time. It's a Bible joke for all you people out there who don't read the Bible. I can see one person who reads the Bible. Thank you, Pastor Derek. Amen. <laughs> but these are the things you learn in marriage. And I'm still learning. I recently learned one of my wife's favorite foods, fruit with hummus. Have you heard of this? Fruit with hummus. Now, I'm not talking about chocolate hummus, which is a thing. It's a very godly thing. No, I'm talking about OG chickpea-flavored hummus with fruit. You know, and, and it's not like I'm a terrible husband. In all fairness, in five years of being married to my wife, I've never seen her eat this food. People start asking me things about her pregnancy, and that's how I learned about this craving, right? They're like, hey, what, what weird stuff is on the menu? And I'm trying to think. I'm like, I don't know, she asked for extra pickles once, but that's not that weird. I do that. And Alyssa's like, fruit with hummus. I'm like, fruit with hummus? What are you talking about? Well, it came out that fruit with hummus was a pre-mat meal. It was something that she enjoyed in college, which if you know my story, I'm thinking, what testimony do you have that I don't know about? Because there's only certain things that you might be doing that might make you crave something like that in college. I don't know. But uh, we, we've seen a lot in five years, especially in ministry. Now, there are stranger things than fruit with hummus. And one of them is this. There's one problem that we see in the lives of the people all around us. It's a reoccurring problem. It plagues people in every area of life, in all walks of life. And it's literally the same problem every time. Every time someone comes to Alyssa or I for counseling, it's about this same issue. 
And we have to be careful when we're counseling people about this issue because it can be comical about how often this thing comes up, and, or we could just become calloused to how frequently this bears fruit in people's lives. And I'm going to list off some examples of how this problem most commonly manifests in people's lives. So if any of these symptoms relate to you, write them down in your field notes, and we'll look back at them later. So the fruit or evidence that this problem exists can look like the following. Lacking peace in your relationship with God, within yourself, or with other people. Lacking peace about your purpose, your future, or your finances. Lacking joy in your studies or your job or just life in general. Struggling with self-control, addiction, bad habits, or the ability to honor boundaries, whether those are your boundaries or boundaries that other people have. How about patience? Lacking patience with God. Lacking patience with yourself. Lacking patience with other people. Lacking patience with the process that you're going through right now, whatever that may look like. A lack of love in your life, whether that's from God or for God or from other people or for other people, there's a lack of love in your life. Or failing to keep commitments, whether that's to yourself or other people. In other words, it's a lack of faithfulness. The list goes on and on. But what I just described to you with the lacking love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, faithfulness, etc., those are not the problem. Those are called fruits or evidences. When fruit is lacking, it acts as a warning sign that points us to the real problem. And as we're about to discover this problem, this problem that has the potential to negatively impact every area of your personal life has a very simple solution. But before we identify that problem and discover the solution, would you pray with me? Father, I give you all the glory for everything that's going to happen this morning. I'm confident that you gave me a word to share, and I pray that you give me the ability to share it. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would touch every person in this room, that no one would leave the same as they came in, that everyone would walk away encouraged, challenged, convicted, equipped to handle whatever it is that you're bringing into their life or removing from their life. I love you, Jesus, and I pray these things in your name. Amen. So our main text from the morning is coming from John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. The text will be on the screen behind me in a few moments here. And I'm about to read the words of Jesus. So I want to issue a warning, a public service announcement, if you will. If what Jesus said is true, if what Jesus said is true, this has major implications for every person on the planet. Whether you're a Christian, an atheist, or anywhere in between, it's important to pay attention to Jesus' words today because if they are true, they deeply impact you. Let me set the scene before we jump into this passage. Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem where they're gathered in an upper room to celebrate the Passover meal. This specific meal was also famously called the Last Supper, as portrayed by da Vinci's painting behind me on the slide here. Should be. Anytime. There you go. This is also the same meal where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Jesus then goes on to tell his disciples that after this meal, he will be betrayed by someone in the room. He'll then be arrested and then he'll be crucified. Knowing that his time was short, that he only had a few moments left, Jesus used the remainder of the meal to share this message. John 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the vine, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. 
You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So we started off our time together talking about a problem that plagues every person that we've ever counseled. And according to John 15, 1 through 8, the problem is this. Fruitless people have severed themselves from their spiritual lifeline, the vine, which according to Jesus is himself, the person in presence of God. Instead of remaining in God's word, they have removed themselves. Instead of abiding in prayer, they have abandoned that intimate connection with God. And when dis disconnected from Jesus, when disconnected from our spiritual life source, people fail to receive the nourishment required to remain fruitful. In other words, fruitlessness is caused by a lacking connection to the necessary and natural nutrients provided by Jesus and his word, the Bible. And what we will discover from our time today is this. Every Christian should bear fruit because they're connected to Christ. If that doesn't make sense now, it will. We're about to unpack what it means to abide in Christ and why fruit is so important. We'll do that by going back to our passage in John 15, verse 1 through 8. Jesus here repeats the word fruit seven times. Usually when words are repeated in scripture, the purpose is to convey importance. So what does Jesus mean by fruit? How is fruit defined? You know, thankfully, the Bible talks a lot about this. There's a lot of information in a lot of different passages about fruit. So what are they? There's the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. There's the fruit of the gospel, the salvations, that's conversions and disciples. There's the fruit of good works. Jesus said in John 14, 12, that whoever believes in him will do the same things he's been doing and even greater things. There's the fruit of repentance, the fruit of praise, which is worship, thankfulness, appreciation, and adoration for God. And there's the fruit of quiet confidence, a quiet confidence. And lastly, the fruit of righteousness and truth. John said in, I'm sorry, Jesus said in John 15, 5, if you remain in me. Other translations use the word abide. If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Is there fruit in your life? Not just a piece here or there. Jesus said you will bear much fruit an abundance of fruit. Your life will be fruitful, full of fruit. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 7, 15, you will know a tree by its fruit. You will know that someone is connected to Christ. You will know that someone has the Holy Spirit. You will know that someone is saved, how? By the fruit. If my life is producing the same things that Jesus' life produced, it's safe to say that we are of the same tree because we are producing the same fruits. But if my life, if my tree is producing thorns and thistles, bad, rotten fruit, things that are harmful to others and the tree, then the world will know that I'm not truly connected to Christ because our trees are not producing the same things. You will know a tree by its fruit. This brings us to our first point. Every Christian should bear fruit because fruit is nutritious. 
This seems like a no-brainer, but if we examined our diets, I'm not so sure that our actions demonstrate our faith in this truth. I've heard it said, and this one is a mind-bender, we only believe what we actually do. Let me say that again. I don't think you got that. We only believe what we actually do. If we believe that fruit is nutritious, but we fail to ever eat fruit and we only go for gummy bears because they're flavored like fruit, we are fools who do not actually believe the truth that fruit is nutritious. Well, throughout our text, Jesus is repetitively communicating to his disciples how beneficial and spiritually nourishing it is to remain connected to him. Specifically in verses 7 and 8, Jesus highlights that remaining in him makes our prayers more effective and demonstrates our discipleship. So whether it's effective prayers or validation of our salvation, the spiritual benefits of connecting to Christ are infinite. And these fruits, they literally benefit every area of our lives, from our relationships to our restfulness, our physical health to our finances, our careers to our kids, our academic pursuits to every other area of importance in our life. These fruits go far beyond us. Have you ever thought about a, a tree in terms of its production of fruit? Who is the primary benefactor of fruitfulness in a tree? Is it the tree? No. Fruit primarily benefits the recipients. In similar fashion, spiritual fruit demonstrates God's goodness to the world around us. Psalm 34, 8 encourages people to taste and see that the Lord is good. While Romans 2, 4 tells us the goodness of God leads people to repentance. So fruit is nutritious for us and for others. Being fruitful is a good thing, a nutritious thing. But according to our text, according to Jesus, every Christian should bear fruit because it is also a necessary thing. Fruit is nutritious. Fruit is necessary. In this passage, Jesus talks about fruit in such a way that if it's missing, if the tree is not producing fruit, it poses a real problem. Such a problem that in John 15 too, Jesus said that God the gardener cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit. Not only are fruitless branches severed from the vine, in John 15, 6, those who fail to bear fruit are burned in fire. I don't know anyone who enjoys burned things. It's bad news. Burned popcorn, burned pancakes, sunburns, razor burns, Mr. Burns from The Simpsons. No one likes burned stuff. But this is the human soul we're talking about. And it's not a temporary burn, it's an eternal burn from the all-consuming fire of the wrath and judgment of God. And this was not an isolated teaching either. Jesus didn't just slip this one in there for fun, hoping no one would notice. There are multiple passages of scripture where the consequences of fruitlessness is addressed. Going back to Matthew 3.10, John the Baptist said this, and I quote, the ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Then a few chapters later, Jesus quotes John the Baptist, repeating that fruitless trees will be cut down and thrown into the fire. If we continue reading in Mark 11, Luke 12, or Matthew 21, we'll find Jesus again and again either cursing fruitless fig trees or threatening to cut them down. Jesus teaches on this repeatedly over and over and over again. So I'm assuming because of the repetition, this bearing fruit or burning thing is a big deal to God. But God is patient. 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us, and I quote, God is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come 
to repentance. Did you catch that? God does not want his people, his creation to perish. So here he is posting warning signs in as many places as possible to prevent people from perishing. Warning people who are living fruitless lives. Warning people who claim to be Christians yet have no proof in their life that they're actually living for the Lord or connected to Christ. Did you know that it's possible for people to look like Christians and sound like Christians only to prove with fruitless lives that they were in fact imposters? Look at Judas. This man claimed to follow Jesus faithfully. And he followed him for three years. He shared daily meals with him. He witnessed his miracles. He heard his deity claims. Yet Judas betrayed Jesus to death. And he did it just moments after this meal and this sermon from John 15. Jesus warned us about people like Judas. They will be present in our lives. They'll be in our churches. They'll be at our potlucks. And in Matthew 13, Jesus told us the parable of the wheat and the tares. Wheat and tares are both found on farms. They look the same and they grow together at the same time. But one will produce fruit and the other will prove to be an imposter. A fruitless weed that will be burned in the fire. Then one more, in Matthew 7, Jesus warned us about false prophets, false teachers, and wolves in sheep's clothing. Jesus said that they will look like sheep, but inside they are ravenous wolves. And then he tells us in verse 20, you will know them by their fruits. So as a shepherd, I have to ask, what kind of tree are you? How can we know? In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, God's word calls us to test ourselves. And I quote, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. What test? The fruit test. According to Jesus in John 15, 8, fruit is the evidence that we are our disciples. Every Christian should bear fruit because it is necessary. In fact, the very first command from God in the Garden of Eden was what? Be fruitful and multiply. Which is interesting because the final command from Jesus after his resurrection, before his ascension, was to go and make disciples. He told his disciples to multiply disciples. He wanted them to be fruitful. God is looking for fruit. Again, I can say I'm a Christ follower all day, but at the end of my life, if I'm not producing the fruit that God is looking for, it doesn't matter. As I was preparing this message, I was thinking about Pastor Ken Strong. He's watching online. Hi, Ken. Besides leading the marriage ministry with his wife, Terry, Ken is also a businessman in the Bay Area. And people expect a very specific product from Ken. If someone goes to Ken and orders a box of light bulbs, and Ken provides bananas, a box of bananas, the people want light bulbs and Ken gives them bananas, it doesn't matter how good that produce is because that's not the product that was paid for. Ken could actually get fired for failing to provide the right product. My point is this. Not all fruits are created equally. You know, it's International Potluck Day, so I felt like sharing this story. I, I recently, not recently, I, I did visit Malaysia probably five or six years ago. And in Malaysia, I got the chance to try so many different fruits, things that I had never even heard of before. You may have heard of them, but I hadn't. I'm talking about the lychee, or the rambutan, the mangosteen fruit, the dragon fruit, the star fruit. Has anyone tried any of these fruits? Yeah, they were all very different, but they were delicious. They were sweet. They were awesome. But there was one particular fruit that I despised. 
For reasons I will never understand, this fruit has been crowned the king of all fruits. And yes, I'm talking about the durian fruit. Has anyone heard of the durian fruit? Now, when I say that all fruits aren't created equally, it's because this fruit, the durian fruit, is deadly. It smells like a mixture of turpentine, onions, and gym socks. It tastes the same, and it has the texture of sour cream. It's disgusting. Not only can the smell kill a small animal, the durian is tightly packed with these violently sharp spikes to protect people, people from actually getting to the fruit. And I think those spikes are there for a good reason. No one should eat this fruit. But the, the durian fruit is so disgusting and dangerous that there are literally signs all over Southeast Asia prohibiting people from bringing the durian fruit into public business buildings, into airports, into public transit stations. This is literally a forbidden fruit. I wonder if durian was the forbidden fruit. It killed people back then, and it has the potential to do it again. I remember one time I was working in my office in Oakland, and, and one of my coworkers brought in a durian smoothie. No one had any idea there was fresh durian in this smoothie. So he goes to his office, and the whole building starts to smell. And people start to panic. They're freaking out. They're thinking there's a gas leak, and they start to evacuate people. People are not freaking out when you bring a strawberry smoothie to the office. But you crack open a durian and people are fearing a biological terrorist attack. It's true. Not all fruit are created equally. Now, I point that out because there are a lot of people in our world today who do some really awesome things. I'm talking about Buddhists, Muslims, Mormons, atheists, agnostics, people who are philanthropists, who are really generous with their time and their money and their energy. But not all fruits are created equally. Jesus is not looking for good fruits. He's looking for God fruits. Let me say that again. Jesus is not looking for good fruits. He is looking for God fruits. Evidence is that God is working in your life because you are connected to Christ. Let me clarify that point for a minute here. Godly people will do good works. That is a fruit of the Spirit. But when those good works are done to impress God or impress others, God sees them as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6 actually says this, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. God is telling us that our good works are like filthy rags to him. He doesn't cherish them. He's not creating bumper stickers out of them. He's not putting them on his refrigerator if God had one. When we try to manufacture fruits in our own efforts, God discards them. He doesn't care about good works done in our strength. He wants to see good works done by the Spirit. So if you're anything like me, you've thought of a question during this message, and the question is this. How much fruit is enough? And I get it. It, it is the wrong question, but I understand why we would ask that. Um, this question presumes that producing fruit is something that we can do by our own efforts, which brings us to our final point. Every Christian should bear fruit because fruit is natural. Jesus said it this way in John 15, 4 and 5, Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In these two verses, verses 4 and 5, the word remain or abide is repeated five times, which is interesting because the word five in Scripture represents God's grace. Jesus was making it clear that we cannot bear fruit by ourselves. The only way to bear fruit is to remain or abide in him. Spiritual fruit is a God work, not a good work, something that's impossible for us to produce on our own. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
So when it comes to bearing fruit, works don't work. We cannot force fruit. To bear fruit, we must abide. Now I've been using this word for the past 20 minutes or so. So what does abiding or remaining look like? And to figure that out, we're going to look at Psalm 1 and Jeremiah 17, which gives us a perfect picture. Both passages describe people who regularly remain in the word of God. These people are personified as trees planted by streams of water who never fail to produce fruit, which aligns perfectly with Jesus' promise in verses 7 and 8 when he says that if his words remain in us and we remain in the word, we will bear much fruit. Here's another way to think about that. Does a tree try to bear fruit? Is a tree struggling and striving to produce fruit? No. Fruit is the natural result of the tree's connection to the necessary nutrients. So here's the biblical principle from Psalm 1 and Jeremiah 17. Where you are planted determines what you produce. Where you are planted determines what you produce. Or the fruit you see depends on what nourishes your tree. If you spend all your free time on Facebook, if you start and end your day with Instagram, if your only source of nourishment is Netflix, it makes sense when fruit is missing or bad fruit is present because you're malnourished. It's the same thing when people only eat garbage and they're wondering why their bodies are breaking down. We need to feed on God's word. We need to pick up God's word, the Bible, and replenish ourselves in his presence. God's word will change you. As you connect to Christ, your tree will flourish with fruit. This is literally a promise, a guarantee from God. You know, last summer, I met a guy named Andy. He wore a leather biker jacket. He rode a Harley, and he had a really hardened heart. And as I started to spend time with Andy, I quickly discovered that he was hurting and his life was bearing some bad fruit. Anger, depression, hopelessness were all present in his life. But Andy wanted to connect to Christ. So we started coming to our Revive Young Adults Bible Study on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. And he also started going to a men's Bible study on Monday nights. And he started reading the word of God for himself on a regular basis. And although I couldn't see the fruit at first, although it took many months, and, and I'm just going to be honest, I was kind of getting frustrated with this process. Like, is anything going to happen with this guy? The seeds of truth from God's word were planted in Andy's heart. And they started doing what seeds do. They took root and they started to bear fruit. Because God's word never returns void. And as a result of Andy's consistent connection to the word of God, his tree started to transform. A year later, I don't even recognize him. He is truly a new creation in Christ. The anger, the depression, and hopelessness are gone, but love, joy, and peace are present in his life. He's making disciples. He's serving in the church. And every chance that God gives him, he's sharing the gospel and sharing his testimony. Andy is an example of what God can do when we're planted in the right place and nourished with God the nutrients. But again, this was not an overnight process. This took time. Because fruit is not fast. Fruitfulness takes time. And different fruits are produced in different seasons. Seasons of suffering will produce different types of fruit than seasons of joy and celebration. And there may be some seasons in your life where you feel like you're getting cut back. Things are getting taken away from your life and you're thinking like, God, I am connecting to you. I am in your word. Why are these things being taken from me? Why does it feel like I'm getting snipped here? You're not being cut off. God's word says that he cuts people back so that they can bear even more fruit. Things will be removed from our lives so that we can produce more fruit. That's part of the process. But no matter what season it is, we have a promise from God that if we abide, we will 
bear fruit. So if it's taking time, keep connecting. The fruit will follow. It's a promise. You know, I just mentioned planting a seed, and I want to plant a seed of my own here. Um, We've been talking about bearing fruit today and how connecting to Christ through God's word is the best way that we can bear fruit. So here's an opportunity to put that into practice. Starting in January, Harvest Valley Church, the entire church will be participating in a corporate Bible reading plan that will take us through the entire Bible, cover to cover in one year as a family. I'll have many more details to come. I'm just planting a seed here, like I said. But if you've never read through the entire Bible before, get ready for revival. Because God's word never returns void and will bear fruit in your life. We're Harvest Valley for a reason. And as we engage, as we connect to God through his word together as a family, we will reap a harvest as a family. So as we come to a close in our time this morning, I'd like to invite our worship team back to the stage. I'll grab some water while they come up. You know, I just spent 10 minutes talking about how fruit is natural, which is true, but it's also supernatural. Spiritual fruit is not just natural, it's also supernatural. Something that only God can grow. From start to finish, fruit Fullness is a supernatural work of God's grace. And if you don't understand the word grace, if grace is unfamiliar to you, we first need to grasp the gospel. In the Garden of Eden, there was a forbidden fruit tree. And God commanded the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, to avoid it because the fruit would lead to death. It was truly bad fruit. It may have been the durian fruit. But they ate it anyway, sinning against God and breaking his commandment. Consequently, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden and cut off from God's presence. That decision of disobedience, that sin against God, caused death to enter the world, and they began to bear bad fruit. Literally the first fruit of their womb, their son Cain killed his brother Abel and it only got worse from there. After the first sin, every human being was born as a withered, fruitless branch cut off from God's family tree. You see, sin is a deadly disease that now affects all people. And sin has separated us from God, making us unfruitful. And it wasn't simply that inherited sin separated us from God. As we remained in sin by our individual choices, as we enjoyed our own forbidden fruits, we continued to be cut off and our branch deserved to be burned. Because the penalty for sin is death, says Romans 6.23. But the gospel... In God's great love, he crafted a plan to graft us back into the family tree. A plan that would take fruitless dead branches, resurrect them, then reconnect them to make them fruitful again. But as a righteous, just judge, God's plan required a payment for the fruitless, sinful, selfish lives of the dead branches. His plan required a sacrifice and a substitute. To fulfill his plan, God became a man in Jesus Christ and he lived a flawlessly fruitful life. Then as a substitute and a sacrifice for us, Jesus willingly connected himself to a lifeless, fruitless branch, the cross, and was cut off from his father literally separated from the presence of God like Adam and Eve in the garden. Jesus allowed himself to experience the consequence of being cut off from the family tree so that he could save you and me. It should have been our branch. But it was Jesus who was burned. 
not in literal fire, but by the fiery wrath of God's judgment on the cross in our place for our sin. This is grace. But God's plan wasn't complete until Jesus, that burned branch, was resurrected and reconnected, and three days later, he did. That resurrected branch, Jesus now bears the fruit of salvation for all who believe and receive this gospel. This is grace. We deserve to be cut off and burned because of our fruitless lives. But Jesus, he paid for it with his fruitful life on the cross. And now because of him, we can live as fruitful branches in God's family tree by being grafted in by belief. It doesn't matter how long you've been fruitless. It doesn't matter how long you've been cut off or separated from God's family tree. Today, right now, you can repent of your sin and return to God. And God will not only graft you in, he will make you fruitful again. That's a promise from God. Anything that you connect to Jesus, even a wooden cross can bear fruit. That's the gospel. But your time is now. This is your opportunity to respond. If the Holy Spirit has been tugging at your heart, saying, hey, that's you. It's time to come back to me. This is your opportunity. If that's you and you say, Pastor Matt, I know you've been speaking to me this morning. My life has not been fruitful. I've been disconnected from God. If that's you, I want you to take a step of faith this morning and raise your hand and just acknowledge, say, hey, that's me. And if you've never connected to God, if you've never been grafted into the family tree, you can raise your hand and receive God's forgiveness, His salvation, and His reconciliation right now. All across this world, this is an international message going across the globe. If you're watching online, anyone in this room as well, and you want to pray this prayer, we're going to pray it as a church. Join me now. Father God, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. Separated from you. I need you, Jesus. I need your perfect life. I need your sacrificial death. I need your resurrected life. And I receive it today. I give you my dead fruitless works and I receive your fruitfulness. Thank you for making that possible, Jesus. I'm yours. Take me forever. Amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise. He deserves all the praise. He does all this work. This is all an act of grace. This is all his work in our lives. Visit www.harvestvalley.org for more details and information.